Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We have a meeting here every month. Uh, Christian Michel is going to give us a talk next month. Uh, but this month we've got uh, Keir Martland on uh, thoughts on libertarian policy. Now, traditionally the libertarian policy under Richard Cobden and Bright have been no foreign policy, but I think Keir isn't particularly satisfied with that particular thing. At least he's got more to say on it. Over to you, Keir. Um, well, to a certain extent I'm satisfied with it, but you've got to put the boot into a few people before you get to the no foreign policy. Um, now, first of all, I've got to apologise for some confusion I might have caused. Uh, I originally decided to set on a preliminary title of uh, Libertarian Strategy because David had r read something I'd written on the LA blog, uh, seemed to like it. Uh, perhaps not the argument, but at least the content, uh, at least the, the quality. Um, but since found out that the Chilcot report would be out this month, um, and therefore you've got to talk about foreign policy when the Chilcot report's out. Uh, but uh, the scope of this uh, will be a bit broader than just the Chilcot report. Um, but anyway, from the outset, uh, I've got to make it clear that this is an incredibly uh, vast topic. Um, therefore, any talk can only scratch the surface, but at least I'll try to be quite comprehensive. Um, and so the first point of any talk about libertarian foreign policy or libertarian thoughts on foreign policy has to be that we regard foreign policy as very, very important uh, because it is quite simply a matter of life and death. Uh, therefore, it's no, um, no coincidence, it's no mistake that Rothbard, uh, that Hopper um, and that Walter Block seem to see foreign policy as the most important aspect of uh, libertarianism, not foreign policy as in having a foreign policy, but an analysis of foreign policy, um, quite simply because its central importance is that war involves the death uh, of people. Um, and also another problem is that modern war is total war. Uh, that means that uh, now there seems to be no real distinction between combatants and non-combatants. Uh, civilians are just as, uh, or almost as, at risk of dying from uh, war as uh, combatants. Uh, and so you get things like carpet bombing, saturation bombing, uh, barrel bombing, uh, and even the threat, if not the employment of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, ultimately. Uh, and so, just to bring this being a matter of life and death home, uh, 120,000 British and colonial uh, subjects uh, died in the First World War. In the Second World War, uh, 60,000 just British subjects, uh, civilian subjects, died. Uh, and in the, the Second World War, 25 million uh, Allied civilians uh, died. Uh, if you get more recent, you get the figure of perhaps half a million Iraqis uh, Iraqi civilians uh, dead as a result of the Iraq war. Uh, I know George Galloway probably puts the figure at about a million, but uh, I'll go with a more conservative estimate. Uh, and when you get half a million dead, there's also many times that number of refugees. I think uh, the conservative figure is about four million. Uh, NATO airstrikes in the Libyan intervention in 2011 Again, conservative estimates put the number of uh, civilians in Libya dead at about 1,000. And the most recent um, civil war that the West has intervened in, being the Libyan civil war, not the Libyan civil war, the Syrian civil war, uh, at least 400,000 Syrians have died and about 80,000 uh, Sy Syrian civilians have died in the Syrian civil war. Um, and yet, because we're not dealing with domestic state policy, because it's not something that we experience every single day, uh, there is a temptation to relegate foreign policy to uh, the back seat. We don't deal with foreign policy nearly enough. Uh, we don't deal with it uh, with the central importance that it, it deserves. Um, and this is because we don't know Iraqis, we don't know Syrians, we don't know Libyans, broadly speaking. Um, but uh, 
I know um, an acquaintance uh, from uh, a conference of the traditional Britain group, uh, Oliver Haste, who grew up in uh, Iraq. And uh, recently I saw a photograph of him uh, playing outside his house, wearing Western clothes, I think a tracksuit of some kind. Uh, he had a kind of fizzy drink in his hand and a toy in the other. He didn't seem in any immediate danger. This was about perhaps 15 years ago, something like that. His uh, mother was a secretary, his father was an engineer. He only has happy memories of Iraq. And uh, so when, when we don't have personal uh, interactions with these countries, it's very easy not to realize the destruction that Western interventions have caused. Another major libertarian objection to war, uh, generally speaking, is that the state expands during war. Uh, Randolph Bourne's quite famous sort of cliched quote when it comes to foreign policy is, war is the health of the state. It expands and glorifies in it. Uh, and you see the state taking control of the economy, the state centralizing power, and you also see the development of a military industrial complex, uh, that being the term that President Eisenhower uh, coined in 1961, uh, just as he was leaving office, I think. Uh, this essentially meaning uh, an iron triangle of war, uh, an arms manufacture, which seems to create perpetual uh, war. And um, also, as Rothbard explained, and more on that later, special interests on Wall Street seem to lobby the American government for particular wars for their own enrichment. Uh, but again, I'll go to the motivations, or the likely motivations for war, a bit later. So to sort of summarize uh, the, the introduction, uh, war is deadly, it's lucrative for um, a very well-connected minority, and is essentially the ultimate expression of statism. So. When you're dealing with the knotty question of what foreign policy should be, you always invariably end up with questions about terrorism as well nowadays. Uh, they have become completely uh, inter intertwined uh, because uh, many people uh, are starting to join the dots here. Uh, and so the question has to be asked, with a terrorism? Uh, much is heard of so-called radical Islamic terrorism, or radical Islam, or Islamism. Um, and th this is particularly a phrase that you'll hear from the, the hard right, using the, the, the prevailing terminology of the uh, Grand Old Party in America. And uh, you'll hear them using this term, and they, they seem very pleased with themselves when they use that term. but it, seems to me that this is a misleading term. Uh, while many terrorists are Muslims, yes, they are usually members of a minority sect of Sunni Islam, and that's not to denigrate Sunni Islam, uh, but I'm just emphasizing that they are part of a part of Islam, and usually they uh, adhere to Wahhabist Islam, uh, and only recently, just to emphasize the fact that these Muslims are not very good Muslims, uh, they very recently attacked the messenger city of Islam, Medina, which suggests to me that they're not very devout Muslims. Uh, and so I would suggest that terrorism is always political. Uh, a good example being the Irish Republican Army, and the troubles in Northern Ireland, again, nothing to do with religion as it's often simplified, but about the political control of Ulster either by ethnic Irish or ethnic English or ethnic Scots. Uh, the ultimate origins, uh, um, as I just mentioned, of the latest wave of so-called radical Islamic terrorism are Wahhabist Islam, and if you go to if you trace the roots of this, then you need not go very far back. Um, you can go to the British Empire and its attempts to destabilize the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they did this by training Wahhabist Islam, uh, Wahhabist 
Muslims to attack um, to, to attack the, the Sufi Muslims. This became more concrete uh, a bit later on uh, with the rise of Ibn Saud in the 1920s and 1930s and then the establishment of Saudi Arabia and then Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1945 uh, entering into a kind of alliance with Ibn Saud and then again that being made much more concrete uh, by uh, by um, the past was diverted. I was not. <laughs> uh, by the Eisenhower Doctrine, which uh, much more explicitly linked the United States and uh, the West generally uh, with uh, Saudi Wahhabism, and then it spread to Indonesia and to Pakistan uh, and elsewhere. Um, again, on, on terrorism, much more well known uh, is the support given by the CIA to uh, Osama bin Laden in the 1980s to fight the Soviet Union. Uh, and much more recently, uh, we have seen the United States arming, funding and training so-called moderate rebels uh, in the Syrian civil war. Moderates which, uh, by the way, do not exist uh, if a few class of course, if you class a moderate as someone who wants to cut half your head off and eat, and eat half your heart, then this is a moderate. I can't take credit for that joke. That's George Galloway. Um, but um, so we've seen pretty, I think, conclusive uh, evidence for something of a lacklustre uh, attempt to, uh, uh, to earnestly reduce... Um, levels of terrorism by the United States and by the West generally. Uh, and so, so much for the war on terror. Uh, and again, for all the talk of unintended blowback, uh, that being the CIA term, uh, a lot of this has not been unexpected. And so, perhaps blowback, again, is something of a misnomer. Uh, indeed, on the eve of the Iraq war, uh, the British intelligence services uh, warned that the Iraq war would make the, stre the streets of London much uh, less safe and we would become more at risk from terrorism. And so, in my view, and I think in the view of most uh, libertarians, at least most uh, perhaps hardcore libertarians, um, uh, war is hardly ever about protecting, um, about protecting domestic subjects, and, uh, and, and even then, very rarely about protecting other subjects, uh, or other citizens, rather. Um, there is usually a more peaceful route to solving so-called diplomatic uh, problems. Uh, and the Chilcot Report said only a few weeks ago that Blair and Bush had not, in fact, used every uh, avenue possible to avert the Iraq war. Uh, and the fact that the, the stated aims of the Iraq war change from month to month suggests that the, the actual aim, or the actual means, rather, of invading Iraq uh, was perhaps not an end in itself, but was more firm than uh, the supposed justifications. Uh, some of the supposed justifications for the Iraq war at the time included the uh, democratization of Iraq, regime change, Interestingly, the punishment of al-Qaeda uh, or the protection of Iraqis, that's also very interesting. Uh, but the means, again, remained the same, that of an invasion of Iraq. Uh, and so, also the Chilcot Report made uh, clear, incidentally, that Tony Blair made the decision to invade Iraq in July 2002, which is a good few months earlier than he, in fact, took it to Parliament. Uh, and so I've said that war is not something which keeps us safe. I've said that terrorism is not uh, something which the West is entirely guilt-free for. Uh, and so the question has to be asked then, uh, why do states go to war? Uh, and the answer that Rothbard would give uh, is quite simple. Uh, Rothbard being an Austrian economist, would put everything down to the action axiom. He would say that human action is purposeful behaviour, that states are 
run by humans, they're not uh, entities which exist uh, and act randomly without any self-interest. Uh, and so the practiological axiom, axiom that human action is purposeful behaviour can uh, perhaps go some way to explaining uh, the, the questions which arise from war and foreign policy. And uh, Rothbard would certainly say that the actions, in the actions of those in control of the state are not random but are taken because the actors believe that war will be advantageous for them personally or for their state as a whole. So if wars are not waged for the general welfare uh, or the common good, then uh, uh, rather if they were waged for the general welfare or the common good, if they were waged to keep domestic citizens safe, then according to a very broad interpretation of libertarianism, some wars might actually be just wars, uh, provided that is um, defined properly, but um, more on a libertarian foreign policy at the very end. But I would just say in response to that, when you look at the overwhelming majority of wars waged by the West, you don't see any advantages for the general populace. Uh, and the, the, the general populace have woken up to this fact once or twice, uh, not very much, but uh, I suppose Vietnam is a good example, although perhaps that uh, is uh, indicative of, um, of uh, an age when uh, deference wasn't particularly fashionable. Uh, the latest intervention in the Middle East also um, served as a very clear refutation of the idea that politicians do take us to war for our own good. Uh, not only have these wars been very costly, uh, I think the uh, total cost to the British uh, taxpayer of the Afghanistan war was something approaching 40 billion. Uh, but they haven't made us any safer. And of all the thousands of civilians killed in Helmand, uh, it's quite telling that not one of them was an international terrorist. Uh, the chaos in the Middle East today, with the rise of ISIS, has led to what the CIA terms blowback across the West, seen in Paris, Brussels, and I could go on right up until uh, not too long ago. Uh, and again, this is something which very few people are willing to say, and obviously understandably. But the ultimate example of World War II is quite shaky, if justified on the grounds of making British subjects safer. Now, without denying the evil of the Nazi regime, it is um, something which shouldn't be taken lightly, the deaths of 60,000 uh, British civilian subjects. Uh, as an aside, while keeping us safer is the sole legitimate purpose of a nation state if one is permitted to exist, uh, a distinction has to always be made between an enemy state and the nation which that state represents. Um, perhaps one of the most disgusting and uh, enduring consequences of the Great War and definitely the Second World War uh, is an entire generation of Britons brought up to literally hate Germans. It isn't at all uncommon to hear men of perhaps uh, age 60 or age 50, in other words, men who definitely did not fight in either the First or the Second World Wars, say such things as, the only good German is a dead German. Uh, or, and this persists to um, my generation, who actually turn out in cinemas to watch films like Inglorious Bastards, which seems in my mind to make absolutely no distinction whatsoever between Nazis and Germans and which seems to condone the killing of all who fall into the, the category of the latter rather than just the former. Uh, and so it, it's imperative, bearing the hatred that can arise from war, uh, on the libertarian to consider the deaths of not just the British civilian dead, but also the 700,000 innocent Germans who died in the Second World War. Other stated ideological purposes for war that is, now we've exhausted the uh, potential practical reasons for war, the potential 
for war making us safer. Uh, there are various other ideological purposes for which wars can be waged, uh, and some of these are more legitimate than others. One of them, uh, which is now no longer a reason, uh, would, be, would have been to stop the spread of Soviet communism, uh, also uh, around the same time the spread of Arab nationalism. Um, more recently, we've seen the idea of humanitarian wars, uh, the idea of a war to uh, prevent the deaths of innocents at the hands of evil dictators. Uh, and again, more recently, we've seen the idea of uh, neoconservative wars, that is, wars to spread democracy, because the idea is democracies do not go to war against each other. And uh, to that, you can only give Hans Hermann Hoppe's very brief refutation of that, which is that, um, yes, wars haven't broken out, by and large, uh, among so-called democratic states uh, since the end of the last two world wars. But that's probably more to do with the fact that American troops are stationed in most places all around the world. Um, and so this doesn't prove that uh, war doesn't break out between democracies. It proves rather that uh, satellite nations uh, do not go to war against other satellite nations, um, or are not permitted to do so. And uh, you can draw the same conclusion from the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a time which ended in the 1990s when a lot of Europe was dominated by Soviet communism and these countries didn't go to war against each other. From that you do not conclude that uh, because Soviet communist dictatorships do not go to war against each other, therefore we have to establish that by military force around the world. Uh, other reasons which are sometimes advanced for wars are on behalf of allies. Now, here I think I have to make it absolutely clear that I do not buy into this very narrow-minded sort of tunnel vision view that American foreign policy and the foreign policy of the West in general can be seen through the lens of Zionism or the lens of uh, protecting Israel. Uh, Dr. Andrew Basovich is very good on foreign policy and his quite good refutation of that is to look at the 1982 uh, war uh, with Lebanon, uh, where Israel was ostensibly one of the victims. Uh, also, you can look at the Reagan administration in, at times, uh, and certainly at the Obama administration, which uh, seems, I think, quite comprehensively to refute the idea that Zionism is pervasive and uh, is, is somehow to blame for all of the world's foreign policy problems. Um, and then lastly, another reason which is sometimes advanced is that of a preventive or a preemptive war. Now, to deal with, I think, most of these reasons in one go, none of these foreign policy aims are what British subjects or um, citizens of other nations pay their taxes for. Uh, preemptive war and war on behalf of allies is an incredibly slippery slope and is a major theme in empires. Uh, indeed, the Roman Empire, when it was expanding, well, it wasn't necessarily the Roman Empire, what we'd think of, uh, but when Rome was expanding throughout Italy and then around the Mediterranean, uh, one of its best justifications was coming to the aid of allies or, uh, again, another slippery slope, uh, making war against them before they make war against Rome. Uh, and you can see, to some extent, uh, a similar arrogant attitude um, in those who direct American foreign policy uh, taking root. The, um, this can be seen really in the fact that um, so active has America been in its foreign policy. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but I heard it somewhere and I believe everything I'm told. Um, America has been at war for all but five years of its existence. Uh, and that should probably give us pause for thought. Uh, so, it, in short, the other reasons that are sometimes advanced by politicians for um, military interventions around the world are recipes, if followed properly, 
for perpetual conflict and therefore perpetual uh, civilian death and therefore the perpetual enlargement and aggrandizement of regional uh, and global <coughs> hegemons. Uh, now, interpreted, I suppose, strictly uh, and carefully uh, and more cautiously, some of these stated ideological claims may be justifiable, again, if we're to permit the existence of states. Uh, in some specific instances, uh, under libertarian theory, but the problem is that politicians rarely, if ever, tell the truth. And if you can't trust politicians to tell the truth about uh, the so-called gender pay gap or the pay gap between the sexes, because I'm told that gender is a more politically correct term which has been foisted on us, um, Stephen Goldberg says that. Or they don't tell us uh, the truth about climate change, then I really don't see how we can trust them on the literally life and death matter of foreign policy. Uh, and so, to go back to Rothbard, it seems almost always the real reason for a war uh, is the enrichment, either in finances or, or in influence, uh, of precisely those who lobby for any particular war. Uh, and now in the core of what I'm going to say, I'm going to look at various examples of wars which uh, perhaps the New Left, as well as the Rothbardian right, uh, would regard as wars for profit. Rothbard sees uh, World War I as particularly instructive. Uh, and he's in no doubt as to uh, one of the main uh, lobbyists for the Great War. And I quote Rothbard, at the moment of great financial danger for the Morgans, the advent of World War I came as a godsend, end quote. Uh, this can be explained in terms of declining financial fortunes for the Morgans at the time. By 1914, the railroad, to use the American term, the railway industry uh, in the United States <clears throat> was sort of entering into a uh, decline. Uh, it had been very heavily subsidized. And um, in 1914 uh, itself, uh, the New Haven Railway uh, of the Morgans uh, went uh, bankrupt, which had been a very expensive project. Uh, and so Rothbard says just as well that J.P. Morgan should become fiscal agent for the British and French governments, underwriter for their war bonds in the United States, uh, and also heavily involved in financing American munitions uh, and other firms exporting war material to Britain and France. Uh, it's also interesting that uh, while channels of communication, uh, because of extensive ma mail censorship at the time, uh, had shut off most communication. Uh, J.P. Morgan was one of the few uh, firms which remained in constant contact with the British uh, government. And uh, J.P. Morgan and other financial interests, clearly against the wishes of the American public, very successfully lobbied President Wilson into uh, joining the, the war effort. Further effects in the United States uh, as a result of the war, once it had been, once it had entered the war, was uh, what you often see, a cartelization of the American economy. Um, the War uh, Industries Board and the War Finance Corporation, uh, with the former being headed by uh, a man called Bernard Baruch, uh, were central in uh, this cartelization of the American economy, which was a, bit, a bringing together of uh, American banks, uh, of big business interests, uh, and of uh, politicians. Uh, Rothbard says of Barrack, who headed the War Industries Board, he says, uh, Barrack, since childhood, who had been a protege of the Guggenheim family, uh, who controlled the American copper industry, was an early supporter of the drive towards war. He had presented a scheme for industrial war mobilization to the to uh, the president as early as 1915, uh, which incidentally is a very instructive year for Britain as well. 
Uh, for the rest of his life, Barak sought to restore the liniments of the wartime model uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, he served as a major inspiration for corporatism, essentially, uh, with, with uh, many big businessmen essentially serving as, uh, this is Rothbard's term, Barak's men in national affairs. In this country, there are very strong parallels, particularly with the year 1915. Uh, the political and economic fortunes of David Lloyd George are very uh, interconnected with the Great War. Uh, in May 1915, following a great uh, disaster, uh, the Battle of... Sorry, I didn't realise you were right there. I'm really late, can I go in? Of course. Yes, of course. And I have a baby. Better late Not a problem. Time. Won't fly with it. Huh? You won't fly. <laughs> fly? Cry. <laughs> it's a joke. Can I see? R and Y. You said something obvious. My pronunciation isn't, needs... Uh, <laughs> my attention. <laughs> um, but around this time in 1915, uh, what you see uh, following a great uh, defeat at uh, the Battle of Festubert, uh, the press then dominated by, uh, well not, not the press dominated by Northcliffe, but the Northcliffe dominated press, that is the, the Mail, uh, the Times, creating out of absolutely nowhere this idea of a shell crisis, uh, the answer of which was more shell. Um, it's instructive that none of the contemporary generals actually agreed with this assessment. Uh, for example, Major General Sir Henry Rawlinson said it was a perversion of the truth. Uh, but Britain had just had a very bad defeat in uh, a battle. And uh, if you, you know, look at the sources, uh, there's no evidence for this. Uh, most people were saying it was really a matter of tactics. Uh, but this explanation was offered by the Northcliffe Press, and uh, David Lloyd George agreed with their remedy, uh, and therefore agreed with the big business and the financial interests in their diagnosis of the problem. Uh, he was asked, uh, once he uh, ended up taking over uh, the responsibility for munitions, he was asked, how many shells should we make? And his quite flippant response was, uh, take Kitchener's maximum, square it, double it, and then double it for good luck. Uh, so as we all know today, much, uh, even though public opinion was more or less on um, Kitchener's side, who was at the time running the war office um, in, in protest, sales of the Daily Mail plummeted by about 1.5 uh, million. Uh, a sustained attack by the press has its effects, and the result was the creation of this. Thank you very much. Uh, the creation of this Ministry of Munitions, which was responsible for munitions and took that responsibility away from the War Office. And David Lloyd George was the favourite of the big businessmen, uh, and very like Wilson, he was surrounded by uh, interests uh, similar to him. Uh, he had struck up various uh, relationships with big businessmen when he was president of the Board of Trade. Uh, and again, we see the creation of uh, a cartel, a cartelized economy with uh, big businessmen, uh, American politicians, British politicians in this case, uh, and banks and so forth, sort of merging together. Uh, David Lloyd George was a very wily man. He had friends everywhere. Uh, he had friends on the other side of the Atlantic and friends uh, on the, the other side of the House of Commons as well. And he was also somehow a popular politician because he was seen as a man of principle, which was uh, soon to be uh, refuted. Uh, but uh, the right people saw David Lloyd George as the man to follow through essentially corporatist policies during the Great War. And so there began this close affiliation between the various interests I've mentioned one of these businessmen in this country was uh, Sir Hubert Llewellyn Smith, responsible for the creation of war risk insurance, uh, protecting shipping company owners, uh, and also behind the creation of this new Ministry of Munitions, uh, and later helped to shape wartime uh, manpower policy. Sir Frederick Black was uh, definitely uh, what, what Rothbard would have called a Morgan man, 
Uh, he was responsible for this uh, creation of uh, J.P. Morgan uh, as uh, the sole purchaser for Britain in the American market. Uh, interesting that uh, most contemporary historians don't pick up on, it, on any of this because David Lloyd George was quite clear in his intentions. Um, he wanted to sweep aside politicians, traditional career civil servants, and uh, the caution that you'd seen before uh, 1915 with big businessmen who he said, and I quote, had touched the industrial life of the country and of the empire at every point. Uh, again, none of this should surprise us about Lloyd George. Uh, he was infamously corrupt. Uh, he was associated around this time with Maudie Gregory, who later went on to sell peerages uh, and make millions from it in today's money. Uh, Lloyd George also had uh, a relationship which, again, has been airbrushed out of um, a lot of discussion of World War I with a man called uh, Basil Zaharoff from uh, modern-day Turkey who uh, was essentially an international arms dealer. And uh, perhaps he's been airbrushed out of history simply because it's quite clear uh, that he sought to prolong the war for his own ends and yet was used by the British, the French, and other governments. Uh, Zaharov said, and I quote, I could have shown the Allies three points at which, had they struck, the enemy's armament potential could have been utterly destroyed but that would have ruined the business built up over more than a century. Uh, indeed, more men than Zaharoff must have known that the war could have ended much quicker. Uh, he could have ended it by 1915 just by blockading uh, German imports, making sure they didn't get any war materials. Uh, or, I understand, there was quite a comprehensive offer of uh, peace made by the Austro-Hungarians in 1916. Uh, but again, in 1916, David Lloyd George said no. And again, we can probably surmise uh, as to why. Uh, this coupled with uh, the fact that no reasonable person, not even a member of the intelligentsia, can come up with a proper justification for World War One, uh, and so seems we're some way on to the conclusion that the Rothbardian view of war is basically true. Uh, I've been talking for quite a while, and so I'm going to miss out the rest of the 20th century, uh, just like that. Uh, but essentially, um, all of this uh, continues to this very day. Uh, Reagan promised Gorbachev that NATO would not expand eastwards. It has. Uh, why? Well, there's no real threat, and so we can probably say that it's most likely so that arms manufacturers can have new markets. Uh, even though citizens of states involved in all of these things uh, are no safer, in fact, probably less safe. Uh, companies like Raytheon, uh, Halliburton, uh, KBR are making an awful lot of money. Uh, uh, in 2012, the 100 largest arms producers and military service contractors recorded nearly £400 billion in arms sales. Uh, with Lockheed Martin being the biggest uh, of those when it comes to arms sales. Uh, and although uh, BAE protests that the government's so-called austerity has hit them very hard, uh, that they're still the biggest non-US military contractor and uh, uh, big, sorry, the biggest non-US military contractor. Uh, and no doubt they'll be very happy with Theresa May and Philip Hammond's announcement that uh, so-called austerity is over. Uh, the war in Afghanistan is, I think, another pretty sound example uh, of the fact that war is very rarely, if ever, uh, to do with making domestic citizens any safer. Uh, coupled with the fact that uh, Al-Qaeda was effectively created by the CIA uh, at the cost of three billion dollars, you don't even have to go to any very dodgy websites or any new left websites to uh, connect some very simple dots. Uh, I would suggest in 2002, quite shortly after the replacement of the government in Afghanistan and the establishment of Karzai, the go-ahead was then finally given to the construction of a $2 billion gas pipeline 
through the country to the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and this was a project that had been put on hold since 1998, uh, when US energy companies uh, inexplicably withdrew. And as early as February 1998, the Americans uh, had then been talking about their support for the pipeline on the 12th of February 1998 in US interests in the Central Asian Republics. And I quote, the only other possible route uh, for this pipeline is across Afghanistan, which has its own unique challenges. Uh, of course, this unique challenge was most likely the removal of the Taliban. And then, naturally, the NATO-friendly interim Afghan Afghanistan government was also oil-friendly, and Karzai was uh, a former advisor to uh, Unicol, which uh, was the company which uh, was planning to build the pipeline. I think the political intrigue behind the war in Afghanistan, following all the political upset after Chilcot, has been pretty well done to death, but not the profiteering. Uh, in the United States, private or publicly listed firms received at least $138 billion worth of American taxpayer money for government contracts, for services which include private security, uh, building infrastructure, or rather rebuilding infrastructure, and feeding the troops. According to the Financial Times, none has benefited more than KBR, uh, which was Kellogg, Brown and Root, uh, which was a former subsidiary of Halliburton, once run by Dick Cheney, uh, which was awarded about $40 billion and received almost all of the reconstruction deals. And so, despite the US and British denials that the, that, uh, the war in Af Afghanistan and the war in Iraq was fought at least partially for oil, American troops were detailed to secure oil facilities as they fought their way to Baghdad in uh, 2003. And after the orgy of looting which followed the, the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein, uh, Rumsfeld ordered that the oil ministry alone should be under American supervision. And um, also in 2007, uh, US written legislation, which was circulated to oil companies before uh, a single uh, Iraqi politician, was passed in uh, Iraq, which detailed that now under uh, production sharing agreements for the next 30 years, uh, Iraq must share its oil with uh, foreign investors, uh, and these foreign investors come from predictable countries. Uh, but of course, as is the wont of the classical liberal, uh, let me put the other side of the argument, as made by Colin Powell in 2003. The oil of the Iraqi people is their wealth. We did not invade Iraq for oil. Therefore, that's comprehensively refuted. Uh, and yet in 1999, Shaney did um, state that by 2010, we will need a further 50 billion barrels a day. And the Middle East, with two thirds of the oil and the lowest cost, is, quote, where the prize lies. And just to make steam come out of, I hope, most of your ears, uh, it's probably a good idea to um, follow up with what Princess Tony is now doing. Um, the last I heard, he was earning around $5 million a year from, uh, from his business in the Middle East alone. And uh, this is particularly interesting. He has been representing JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Uh, and I'm sure David Cameron will suddenly realise his lifelong vocation for investment banking over the summer recess. Um, and in Libya, this was perhaps particularly uh, revolting. You were hearing uh, stories in the news and seeing headlines in the press of this scramble for investment in Libya, uh, even before the, the fall of Tripoli, uh, with headlines uh, such as this one from Reuters, Investors, I promise, pitfalls in post-Qaddafi Libya. And that article then later went on to note, 
how um, a new government in that country could, quote, herald a bonanza for Western companies and investors, end quote. Again, oil may have been a factor, uh, with Libya being the biggest, uh, having the biggest oil reserves in Africa. Uh, and it's perhaps unsurprising, perhaps surprising, uh, to hear what the information manager of the rebel-controlled Arabian Gulf Oil Company, uh, which was at that time Libya's largest oil producer, had to say about who it might be prepared to do business with following uh, the, topple, the toppling of Gaddafi and the end of the NATO mission. He said, and I quote, we don't have a problem with Western countries like the Italians, the French and UK companies, but we may have some political issues with Russia, China and Brazil. Uh, and while the cost of the NATO intervention was very cheap, at around half a billion dollars, the returns are huge. Um, the, the returns on uh, this scramble for investment, this uh, so-called bonanza, in, uh, in the destroyed portions of Libya uh, could be uh, over $300 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, the latest round of interventions are, of course, uh, Syria and Iraq again. Uh, incidentally, the, the stock price of the Pentagon's uh, contractors hit all-time highs once these interventions were announced. Uh, and it seems that if the Hawks get their way, there'll be tens, uh, if not hundreds of billions uh, of new business for Pentagon contracts over the next uh, decade. Uh, furthermore, uh, leaving aside the, the specifics of, of what seems to be a five-way civil war in Syria, um, Saudi Arabia, rather Syria, provides a uh, I think a pretty good illustration of the need to, if not completely sever, to reevaluate the West's relationship with Saudi Arabia, our biggest Middle Eastern trading partner, despite its role in exporting Wahhabism. Not content with being one of the ideological homes of ISIS, according to Patrick Cockburn, substantial and sustained funding from private donors in Saudi Arabia, to which the authorities may have turned a blind eye has played a central role in the ISIS surge into Sunni areas of, of um, Iraq. Uh, and again, to, to go back to um, stock prices um, of, of contractors, whenever there's another Paris or another uh, Brussels or another Orlando or a Nice, uh, these seem to also perpetuate the military industrial complex and indeed every time these happen shares in uh, defence stocks in Lockheed Martin uh, or Northrop Grumman uh, seem to soar and the same happens in this country for Rolls-Royce and BAE and so all this in mind uh, we have to go to the cliche that we hear on the media uh, every time something like this happens and every time there's an inquiry. Lessons must be learned. Uh, but people seem very unwilling to learn the right lessons. Even Frank Ledwidge, who was a very strong critic of the Iraq war at the time, said of that war, quote, there are no new lessons here, only one rather important old precept. Before you engage in a war, Understand the environment you are going into, precisely and realistically what it is you are trying to achieve, and will it be worth the cost? In other words, have a strategy. And yet this lesson seems to me to be entirely mis, uh, misguided. Uh, we've all decided to learn this lesson, uh, but it does suggest that politicians are simply naive, uh, that they don't have any kind of strategy, uh, but fail to do what they decide to do properly. This uh, analysis is completely faulty. I would suggest that rather than thinking of the state as a doctor who accidentally uh, bumps off one or two of its patients, we should regard the state as uh, a serial rapist 
whose only mistake, as far as it's concerned, is getting caught in the act. And so what do you do with a rapist who is caught in the act? I would hope what you would first do is apprehend him uh, and then put him in prison for quite a long time. And then once he's been released, you don't give him Viagra again. Uh, of course, you can't contractually, you, you can't forbid him from being sold. Uh, sold that, but you would rather hope that he wouldn't indulge in it. And that rather convoluted analogy would be how I would uh, describe the military industrial complex. Uh, and so, what do we do to confiscate that drug? What would a libertarian foreign policy look like? Again, to the extent that wars um, will happen because we have states, to the extent that we permit states to exist, there must be no ideological or euphemistically humanitarian wars, no war whose aim can mutate into, uh, other, war, um, into other war aims a la Afghanistan with the removal of the Taliban uh, after the, uh, the punishment of Al-Qaeda, and no war whose aims are vague and even ultimately subjective. No complex military alliances. No supranational military structures. No wars for corporate America or for corporate Britain, for that matter. No indiscriminate total war. No war before every other conceivable diplomatic avenue has been fully explored. Uh, but to come back to Rothbard, he would end by saying the trouble is still the state. You need angels to run a state if the military industrial complex is to be ignored and to disappear. Uh, indeed, we have to push, again this is going back to the ultimate libertarian strategy, we have to push for uh, radical decentralization, we have to push for secession and ultimately the breakup of the nation state uh, itself once we have, of course, dismantled supranational uh, um, setups like the European Union. And uh, once you've done that, things may hopefully return to sanity. But uh, you can vote out the Conservatives in 2020, but you can't vote out the military-industrial complex. Uh, and so I would say, if we're going to have a state, you need people with scruples in charge of the state. That's not very likely, uh, because the worst people rise to the top. Therefore, we need to still continue pushing for a fully and uh, pure libertarian society with no state. And I think I'll finish there. Yeah. Is there any questions or questions? Right. Yeah, um, you did mention Syria, but given that it's not a major oil producer and it's a pretty, it was a pretty weak country, no considerable threats, in fact, it didn't have some sort of psychopath like Saddam in charge. Mm. Uh, how would you explain the West's destabilisation of Syria, given that that was planned about 15 years ago, as senior sources have admitted? Um, it may just be that the destabilisation of, of any state is an end in itself, because uh, the United States, uh, as George Friedman explains for Stratfor and for Geopolitical Futures and for other um, websites like that, um, the United States doesn't need to win wars, it just needs other people to lose wars. Uh, the United States doesn't set out to go and conquer a state and rule it from Washington. The United States just needs to create a bit of chaos. Um, and that then prevents the growth of uh, stability in a region, then ultimately uh, a hegemon that could ultimately then join with other hegemons to challenge its economic and political power. Um, and so that does seem to be what um, uh, the American state has been doing and other states, of course, uh, in, uh, in NATO. Uh, I think the best illustration of this, that they haven't been very good at covering this one up. They've been really candid about it. Because um, in autumn 20, 2013, um, the aim, rather like the, the back and forth of the aims for the Iraq war, uh, the aim for going into uh, Syria was to uh, arm the rebels, 
and uh, to topple Assad. Uh, and then two years later, in December 2015, I think, uh, the aim was uh, to uh, deal with ISIS, which of course had developed uh, at least partially and at least indirectly through, um, through Pentagon and CIA uh, funding and arms and, and training and so forth. Uh, but the, the means remain the same. The means remain the, remo remain the removal of Assad, uh, who seems and has seemed for a while quite willing to strike up some kind of working relationship with uh, other states that America deems as threats, like uh, Iran and like uh, Russia, uh, and also uh, other sort of organisations like Hezbollah. Uh, so it seems they will just come up with any justification for that, um, but it may just be that the removal of Assad is an end in itself and the instability that will result is an end in itself. I, I don't know. Um, but he's been quite he's been quite successful at resisting it. You all right, Richard? Yeah. Nico? Yeah, um, I mean, in addition to, 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 to his question, I, I think you put a little bit too much emphasis on, on profits taken by, by various various uh, companies and so on. I mean, I'm, I'm not denying that, that there are people profiting from, from wars, I, absolutely, and they certainly try to lobby for these wars. But I think there's, uh, there's often a lot of different uh, types of, of lobbies with different interests are, are lobbying for wars. And I wouldn't necessarily put it in, in, in a way like, I got the impression that when we listen to what, what you're saying that, that there is some kind of great master plan going on and they know what they're doing. And I think they often don't know what they're doing. There's various interests coming together and what you get is, is just genuine chaos, which is not planned. There is no plan to do chaos. I think a lot, of, for example, take the Iraq war. I think a lot of these neocons really believed they go in there, they topple Assad, and and, and, and create some kind of great Western democracy there. I think they really believed that. And um, uh, of course there were some people who profit from that, but they, they just don't know what they're doing uh, here. And, and uh, there is a lot of, of real politics going on and, and just real power plays going on uh, that, that are difficult to understand because um, for, for a rational observer, it, it doesn't make sense, and it is kind of obvious that it doesn't work. But for these people, it, it does make sense, and and they really believe it will go into work. That's, that's well, yeah, but God help them if if they they seriously did believe that. That there are um, definitely a, a lot of evangelical um, uh, Christians w within uh, the, the broad sort of foreign policy coalition that you see in the United States, and maybe uh, maybe that factored into it, uh, but. Perhaps um, profit isn't uh, the only aim, but it's certainly an aim for some, and they are certainly instrumental in carrying out these interventions. You couldn't do it without them. And the trouble is when you give them power and influence, uh, and when you keep giving them uh, the profits and, and the cost plus contracts and things like that, uh, they grow in power and they grow in uh, their friendships with, um, with politicians. Uh, to the extent that they are then definitely in a position to lobby for wars, if not to only assist the state in, in, in their execution. Uh, but yeah, it's a difficult one. You can't make a window into, into men's souls. Um, but it, it seems to me that the line that uh, politicians who take us to war sincerely believe in what, what they're saying is a bit naive. All right with that, Megan? Yeah. Oliver? Uh, thank you, Kate, for that talk. Uh, should we not be pushing for an official sort of separation of the special relationship? Because uh, it seems to me that there was, and you, you touched on the Vietnam War, and of course, it, there wasn't just uh, opposition to the war amongst the public. I mean, there was an opposition to the Iraq War, I think it was a million march or something. Maybe not a the difference. Um, but what happened with, with the Vietnam War is, is Wilson said no. We're not going to go in and, and, and go in and announce that. Now, there was obviously a, a lack of um, uh, enthusiasm for intervention, possibly of the Suez, and, and uh, sort of foreign policy people who weren't keen to intervene. I said, what, what has changed? My question to you is what has changed in foreign policy when Wilson said, no, we're not going to 
and, and SIDS, in which we've cozied up to the Americans. And Bush, uh, Blair turns around and says, we're, in, we're with you, whatever. What has, what has changed? Why, can't we, why isn't there a, a sort of more of a nationalistic approach? Because so we should have our own problem. You know, we should be chugging up to the Iranians, maybe, before we even mm. start with it. Whatever is all interesting. Oh, if you would just look at sort of British interests in a nationalistic way, in a line of terrorism, you just think, why isn't there a sort of nationalistic uh, push for this, which would divorce the Americans, which have got no interest in the Americans, but uh, in the British uh, in the well-being mm. system? Um, it, it seems that it's um, this... Um, what, you, what we can sort of broadly call neoconservative foreign policy is quite recent. Uh, I mean, Wilson said no because he was in a position to say no. Uh, Wilson said no because it hadn't yet, this relationship hadn't uh, yet started in, in the phase that we're talking about now. Uh, and we were just emerging from an empire. We still had this idea that we could uh, have relationships with states as and when we liked. Uh, but um, it, it does seem to have just been this sort of poor line conversion to um, neoconservatism that, that, that Blair had. Uh, when he had that poor line conversion, I don't know, but he certainly just, it came over him. And uh, it's going to be quite difficult to sever those links following that, but we were, ha we were probably in a, a pretty good foreign policy position before Blair uh, in, in terms of meeting uh, you know, uh, other states as and when we wanted to. Uh, but I, I see very few, uh, very small uh, chances of severing uh, the, the link that you're talking about um, at the moment, uh, partly because we're not going to elect a government in the foreseeable future, which will be made up of um, people who are generally averse to war. Uh, Conservative Central Office is quite good at selecting pro-war. Prospective parliamentary candidates, and uh, the Labour Party is dead. You can rejoice at that for various reasons, but for this reason, uh, you know, what what do you want? Do you want Theresa May or do you want Jeremy Corbyn? Um, Corbyn would go into Iran. No, Corbyn wouldn't. Uh, but again, Corbyn wouldn't take that decision. Uh, but again, as I was saying, you can't vote out the military-industrial complex. So we're in a very difficult situation to the extent that I, I do think um, that the, uh, the restoration of any sanity to foreign policy is uh, pretty near impossible uh, while a state exists. Uh, and so I would emphasize radical centralization, secession, and so forth. Mr. Chapman, what's no, your name, by the way? Yeah. What's your name, by the way? Uh, uh, yes, um, let me think. Uh, well, Donald Trump said, I would not have gone to war in any of those places. He also said, quite contrarily, what did he say? He said, uh, I'd have an army so big. Mm. But what he says all the time is, I know how it works and I'm above it. And I'm having nothing to do with those special interests. So, um, I don't really know what the question is. Uh, should we An evaluation of Trump, yeah. basically. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you don't know what he thinks. Uh, one advantage is you can't buy a billionaire. Or rather, it's very expensive to buy I'll a give billionaire. you two billion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need more than 4.5 billion. Uh, that's the official figure. Um, but, you know, we don't know. It's just a question of trusting both uh, candidates based on what they've said. Uh, but again, we can't trust Hillary Clinton, and Hillary Clinton we can probably trust to be to be um, essentially a neoconservative. Uh, Trump is not Ron Paul on foreign policy. Trump um, has been very good of late on foreign policy. He, he has uh, said some very good things on Iraq and so forth. But his foreign policy isn't a consistent non-interventionist uh, or constitutionalist foreign policy. It's basically an America first foreign policy. And therefore, if Donald Trump does perceive it to be in the material interests of a lot of people in the United States, um, you know, it, uh, or good for his electoral uh, chances uh, come 2020, uh, then he would probably go and, and bomb somewhere just as readily as someone else would. We're just, we're, you know, we're exchanging uh, one uh, very aggressive foreign policy based on uh, 
uh, chumming up to various corporate interests and creating instability, uh, perhaps for the sake of instability, and um, a slightly less aggressive foreign policy, which is, uh, first of all, articulated by someone we can't fully trust, uh, and second, by, um, you know, by someone who uh, was for the intervention of, of, of Libya, at one point, so I think, I think to Tobias, he, he was like, No, 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 you touch Israel, you die. I think he was like, ISIS, if you're a seven century yeah. barbarian burning women, and all well, the rest, that's it. So it's a bit like logical coming back to you. Well, we'll see, but I think Hillary will win. I think we'll probably get Hillary for demographic reasons. Um, oh, really? Richard, Richard, and then Bob. Yeah, this is a So, why do you think so many? Um, libertarians in the sort of semi-establishment think tanks avoid talking about foreign policy either play with uh, avoid criticizing uh, foreign policy the interventions in Iraq and so I mean, you can check this on Twitter for example their feeds after chill but completely ignoring it complete, complete, complete silence and we're still uh, one or two famous libertarians have actually supported the Iraq war or gone out to help the uh, collaborate with the puppet government imposed in Iraq or Ukraine how would, you, how would you explain this sort of problem? Um, talking about foreign policy isn't popular. Um, talking about foreign policy is quite divisive. Uh, talking about foreign policy uh, gets you involved in all kinds of questions that most sane people don't want to get involved in. Uh, it just so happens that most of us in this room aren't sane. And therefore we're willing to get in involved in those, in, in those, um, in, in those questions. Um, generally speaking, what you refer to as semi-establishment libertarian think tanks, um, they don't have a good record on many things, um, you know, let alone just foreign policy, but one of the most important issues. Um, and, and so it may be, uh, as I said at the beginning, just perhaps a laziness, uh, an unwillingness uh, to uh, address something which uh, most people don't have to think about in day-to-day -day life, or it might be, uh, it, it might simply be to avoid unpopularity, I don't know. Um, but um, it, it ultimately does boil down to a question of strategy. Uh, and I, I would say that the, the best strategy there is, is to just be as consistently radical as you can, uh, just be as consistently truthful as you can. Uh, and if people disagree with you, we'll let them present the facts. Well, uh Money is useful, it allows you to buy nice stuff. Um, and politicians realise this, they're not entirely full. Uh, but I think you're underestimating the importance they place upon their face in history, their mark, which is partly worth the same point as Nico made. Their place in history, their, uh, their well, utility moments, never a word for it. Um, in any event, they wish to be war leaders if it's all possible. They don't want war, of course, of course, Paris thought. But should it come? Oh, should it come? Well, oh, they should adopt the church union, growl, they should, oh, oh, oh. they should be rushing in and out of um, Downing Street to be um, photographed a hat wearing a, a cap wearing a tin helmet. Whatever it might be, they wish to be famous. Oh, that's a bit of money on the side. Of course, of course. Book tours afterwards, yes, 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 that's to be expected. But it, it's being a war leader. That's the stuff. That's the stuff. They love it. They love it. It's not just money. It's not just subsidies from big industry. They like all that, but they'll do it without that. If they just have to tax everybody to fight a war, which I, I think they do, hmm. they'll yeah. fight the war. No, I, I agree to an extent, but there are lots of other perks to being a politician, and um, uh, one of those perks involves sort of being made for life once you leave office. Um, yes, these people are attention seekers, but they, they probably get enough attention as it is. Um, and wars are quite hard work, and politicians also don't like hard work. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they, they like being a war leader, I, I accept that. You only need to look at David Cameron's, the, the grin on David Cameron's face as he uh, stormed in with um, Sarkozy. The um, when he stormed into uh, Libya and was hailed as a war hero, uh, not, not by the British people, uh, but by uh, Libyans who uh, 
who were chanting his name and everything. Yeah, obviously uh, he loved that, but who who wouldn't uh, uh, love that? But also, um, you know, we see that in in public. That that's not something which is really up for debate. We know politicians like being in the limelight. We know they like um, bigging themselves up, but. The stuff that generally make, sort of doesn't make its way into the press is the profiteering of Halliburton, KBR, and so forth. Um, and you know, as, as much information that makes its way to, to, to libertarians, the better. Emma, uh, Pat? Yes, I'd like to ask a deeper question, really, about what you were talking oh. about um, doing away with the state. Mm -hmm. So they won't be able to create laws. Um, what, what, what would you say about the angle? The, I mean, most wars now, certainly for the West, certainly for the civilized world, I mean, they're wars where people who go to, to fight in the wars. For them, it's pretty much of a holiday. They uh, sign up, they know what they're letting them in, they're selling in for, and they're not conscripted. Uh, they, they know what they're doing. Um, whereas, without a state, they may find themselves fighting for their very lives and their families, fighting for their food. I'll, just a, I'll give you a simple example. A few years ago, there was a petrol driver's strike in the UK. It only lasted, I think it was about three days, something like that. You might remember that. I think about that. Now, there was a lot of fighting on the island of dogs in supermarkets over bread. And that was just for two or, two or three days of uh, petrol drug destroyed. It's frightening to think that we've got 65 million people on this small island and we have to import a huge percentage of our food because we can't feed ourselves. That takes a lot of administration. A lot of pen pushing, a lot of keyboard rattling, a lot of paperwork, a lot of communication, a lot of kind of anti libertarian things, really, because people have to get up in the morning. Oh, to oh, oh, oh. And you know, they have to uh, abide by laws and communicate. It's got in a way a bit of pragmatic things. If that thing stopped, even for three days, Isn't there a chance that you might, your next door neighbor will be <coughs> killing you for food? Isn't that a possibility? Right. And incidentally, that wouldn't be recorded so that future generations, where they read about our history. Come on, but is there a question in all this? Uh, Could we have a rising <coughs> inflation at the end of something? <laughs> there wouldn't be any record of that happening because there would be, and no one would be recording it because libertarians. Wouldn't be sitting down recording history. In fact, it might have happened, but nobody told us. Yeah. <laughs> Libertarians wouldn't be recording history. What was the question again? <laughs> he hasn't got one, I'm sorry. Is, that, is, that, is it, was it something? Was the is, there anyone, is there anyone else who wants to. Uh, I'll have a think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be Pat. I'm going to be Pat. We'll, we'll no, continue after well, this. One we can think about. I actually have the same question. Oh, you have the same oh, well, question as him? Yeah. Oh, so you, you actually exactly, recognise these questions. Not exactly the same, but, <laughs> so I'm not. But, you know, sometimes I call myself libertarian, sometimes I don't. And I think, after meeting a few libertarians, I don't think I am a libertarian. It's on this point, which is... It has an effect on me, too. <laughs> <laughs> on this point, which is, you mentioned a couple of times, if we were to have a state, if we were to uh, you know, allow a state. So the deeper question that he had, I'm not sure we, you know, we have time to get into it, yep. because this is some kind of new to rock and libertarianism and anarchism and all that. What did you mean by that? So do you really think that we could have no state and have a viable society? This is a deep question. I think that's what you're getting at because you're saying if we don't have a state, are we all going to kill each other? And I've, had, I've, I've, had, I've heard that from people who that's their impression of libertarianism. Right, okay. Well, that is a vast question which could yeah, have filled the talk. It's a question which really goes down to the fundamentals of legal theory uh, and how um, a libertarian law code, which is essentially just the defence of uh, private property, uh, will be enforced. Uh, 
it's, it, it's quite difficult sort of synthesizing it into um, a, a short answer. But, uh, Do you think is any time justified? It would be, would, instead of going deeply into it, because you kept on mentioning if we were allowed, if we would allow a state, would you allow a state in any circumstances? No, because a state is always, um, by definition, redistributive. Uh, a state always redistributes wealth away from productive activities, by definition to unproductive activities because of the law of demonstrated preference. Um, if you had a pre-existing market, uh, let's say with arbitration agents protecting private property uh, and with, you know, uh, uh, some form of private, what Hobbes calls private government, uh, also resolving disputes and so forth, uh, and then you established a state, well, by definition, because of the law of demonstrated preferences, you would get a redistribution of income away from what people want it to be spent on, which is you know, the cheapest, most productive, uh, most uh, utility maximizing use uh, of, of money and resource and so forth, to other ends uh, which consumers and producers uh, did not demonstrate a preference for. And the bigger the state, the more you get that tendency. Uh, and for you know, you have to understand that. A state is not something that could exist organically. Uh, a state, because a state does not produce anything. Uh, everything that the state originally has, the state uh, takes, the state expropriates, uh, and then makes some use of in a way that it assumes uh, people might have spent it, or in a way that will benefit uh, the people running the state. And so a state isn't something that could, could exist organically. Um, and so the more of a state you have, uh, in a sense, the less of a society you have, because the less of an economy you have. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know, these are questions that have been addressed at length by uh, different wings of libertarianism, by David Friedman, by Murray Rothbard, by Hans Hopper, and there are whole books dedicated to it, and so a five-minute answer is, is not good enough, really. Yeah. Um, we can discuss it in the bar I afterwards. Yeah, I'm saying I'm going to ask yeah. you, uh, I don't agree, mm -hmm. so I'll probably... Yeah, yeah. I would answered it quite differently from Kerr, but is there any other questions? The bar, the bar. Richard? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think it's wise uh, for libertarians to form a strategic alliance with some of these leftist anti-war groups like the Stop the War Coalition? Is that a potential way forward? To the extent that they tell the truth, yeah. Uh, now... It won't probably be, won't be very fruitful because most of these people aren't very clever. Uh, I know lots of so-called Corbynists, and I know lots of um, people who aren't Corbynists in, in the Labour Party. And it seems to me that the Labour Party is dead because of the Corbynists, because these people are people who are joining the Labour Party and the, wor the worst kind of people in a political party you could ever want. Um, they're essentially checkbook members, and you know that is it. They don't turn up to AGMs. They won't canvas, they won't do anything physical apart from perhaps send spam email. Um, and they don't do any thinking themselves. Uh, most of the people that you will generally find um, on the, the new new left, uh, that is this massive surge in popularity that you've seen very recently in anti-war movements, um, have just stumbled upon it by luck and uh, are very reluctant to read anything that uh, contradicts their point of view. Uh, however, to the extent that their, their best and brightest actually say something that's true, yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, Pat, you, you've already had a long say. Uh, <laughs> what did you mean by succession when you said Oh, secession, with an E. Uh, secession uh, means part of a state that already exists, leaving that state and being its own state. Yeah, so how would you imagine that exactly? How would it happen or how would it work? Well, you said I would recommend decentralisation and that. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Okay, um, well, the, the way you, you get the movement going is you invest time, energy, and money in already existing devolution, regionalist, and secessionist okay, so movements like the Yorkists. Are you saying that a part of the country would then 
separate from the rest of the country? Uh, yeah, in the sense that it would be a different political entity. Uh, but we, what you most likely actually find is relations between that political entity and the rest of the United Kingdom being just as, if not more so, harmonious. Um, that there would be. Uh, it's called of, Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, Scotland. I was looking for a, a subsidy. Try, <laughs> to Andrew. Cheers, Kim. <laughs> Well, even though most most Scots nationalists aren't aren't um, really with us on most stuff, it, it would still force them then to eventually become libertarian because they'd have fewer people to expropriate, uh, and they'd have uh, much less chance of actually having a socialist state, which most of them seem to want, but um, it wouldn't last very long. No. No, 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 Pat. You've gone too long. <laughs> Uh, I suppose we'll wind you up and continue in New York. Thank you very much indeed, Kurt. Very lovely.